enjoy life's little pleasures. Download Koba on Play Store, App Store, or access via the WhatsApp channel 0242 426 186. 0242 426 186. Or just dial star 365 hash and follow the prompts. Koba, our lives simplified. Hello, Doc. Good morning. Good, morning. <laughs> Good to have you here, Dr. Wadri. Uh, Sairam Wadri is our guest today. Like I mentioned, he's a pediatrician at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. So, Doc, without wasting much time, let's just uh, start off now uh, with the, the questions that we couldn't take last week. And um, uh, one was sent in by a colleague. In fact, he tells me that it recurred what uh, he shared with me recurred so um he says my six-year-old daughter has been complaining of toothache for over a year now i took her to the hospital but they couldn't find anything she's been on painkillers all this while my concern what could be the cause and won't she get any side effects from all the painkillers that she's taken um good morning good morning <laughs> So um, we know that pain usually is, is um, a symptom that something is wrong. So I would say that something is wrong. Um, he needs to take her back to hospital because mm -hmm. sometimes you need, um, when you see um, a practitioner or a doctor first, they think about certain things and then they manage you according to those things that they thought was the problem. Mm -hmm. But it, if it is not going or you don't have any relief, then you need to go back because sometimes they know that what they thought initially was not it so that they can think about other things. Um, tooth pain is usually from the area of the tooth and the gums, but sometimes it can also be referred pain. It can be pain from elsewhere. So it's important that the child goes back to hospital, see a dentist, and then um, the child can be sorted out. Mm. Um, as to taking pain medication, yes, every medicine has side effects. Everything has side effects, actually. Um, that is why you need to be careful to dose it according to the weight, um, or if no weight is available, the age of the child. Um, this, I think, needs to be seen again in hospital mm -hmm. so that the doctors can think about other things that they didn't think about initially because okay. that's how we work. We look okay. at common things first. Mm -hmm. And if that is not it, we think about other things in order not to waste your time and money and all that. Okay. Needs to go back to hospital. Okay, great. I, I know he's listening. He tells me that he had to go to the hospital on Thursday and Friday. Um, hopefully, if you can update us on what happened, then we can see uh, if you have any more uh, that you can share on that. Y yes, please. And mm -hmm. sometimes, too, um, you, you really need to ask what is the problem so that it will be explained to you and then if you are not satisfied you may even need to find a second opinion mm. on, on what is happening. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, there's a question here about uh, a, a child wetting their bed. It says, hi, good morning. I'm Rosemary from Ashaman, I guess. My boy always wets his bed thrice a week, especially when the weather is very cool. I mostly wake him up three times in, in the night, but before morning, the bed will still be wet. Please, what do I do? It's a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. No, um, can, we, can we just cross-check that again? Um, I missed that. Yes. Um, Okay, no okay. She, she didn't mention the okay. age. She actually said three times in the night. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, bedwetting, um, depending on the age, mm. may be normal or abnormal. And then it's also abnormal if the child was dry and then now becomes wet. So a child may be so young that the child would wet the bed or there may be a problem if the child was dry, wasn't wetting the bed and all of a sudden begins to wet the bed. Because there is no age, mm. um, it may be just that the child is too young to be um, dry in the night, um, or it may be a problem. Now what she can do is to start with behavioral management. For instance, when it's um, in the evening, say beyond six, the child should not drink fluids. Um, should have the evening meal early, should not drink fluids. Should uh, sorry, should not drink fluids. Should not drink uh, water, juice, okay. uh, late, close to bedtime is what I mean. Okay. So that is why um, the child needs to have the meal, the evening meal early. Because when you eat, sometimes you drink water. And then close to the evening meal, say from beyond 6 o'clock, the child shouldn't drink any fluids. That's assuming the child is going to bed around 8 p.m. And then goes to use the washroom before going to bed. And then aside that, waking up is part of the training process. Mm. So she will need to wake the child up. 
um, maybe once or twice to um, use the washroom mm. so that the child doesn't wet the bed. Okay. But if the child is still young, you know, some children, um, the children develop at different rates. So some children just developmentally are not ready to stop wetting the bed. So if it's a young child, then this child probably is not um, developmentally ready to wet the bed. And um, it's a boy. We know that boys, um, they don't attain dryness at night as quickly as girls. So that's also oh, something okay. that will come into play. Okay. So it may be just the child is not developmentally ready. Mm. But if this child was dry and then it's now wet, like I'm saying, that's a problem. It can be a urinary tract infection. It can be that the child is reacting to certain stresses in the house. In fact, it can also be abuse. So it's a different story if the child was dry and it's now okay. uh, wet, mm. or if the child was not dry at all, and also depending on the age of the mm. child. Okay, uh, but she also mentioned something about the weather, especially when it's cool. Does, does that have anything to play, especially with the behavioral uh, aspect you were talking about? I think when it's cool, you see, for you to wake up and um, use the washroom, you need to wake up. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. And you know, when the weather is cool, a lot of us tend to sleep a bit deeper. So it's more difficult to wake up when the weather is cool than if um, the weather isn't cool. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe why um, All right. this is happening. Next question. Good morning. Please, my daughter is eight months and in the night she coughs and vomits. During the day, she doesn't eat. She only takes breast milk. What might be the cause? And the Simon Doe send in us this message. If... Um, Simon's daughter was exclusively breastfed to six months. Um, for the daughter to begin to take the semi-solids, it's often a bit um, dicey because the transition must be very slow. If breast milk is nice, so if you've had it for six months, then um, the transition must be gradual. And actually, um, when they begin to take um, semi-solids after the exclusive breastfeeding, mm -hmm. mostly it is just for taste because they are still not really ready. The body is still not really ready to digest all these things. So mostly it's just for taste. That is why the breastfeeding has to also continue. So I wouldn't say that at eight months, if a child is not really accepting solids and is breastfeeding, um, most of the time it's a problem. Mm. The introduction of semi-solids has to be gradual. It's not like boom, then you give something and then the child accepts okay. it. Sometimes you may get lucky. The children accept it and it's all well and good. But if they don't, it needs to be gradual. But they are still getting a lot of nutrition from the breast milk because a lot of their digestive organs are not really ready for all these things that we give. So mostly it's just for taste and for learning that you can eat these foods. Um, vomits and, and coughs cough. at night. Cough, which is only at night, is usually a problem that is usually a symptom that something is wrong. Um, is the child put to bed in a position which makes it easy for things that were swallowed to come up? That's a consideration. Or is this child somebody who is um, has allergies so that in the night when the weather is cold, those allergies tend to manifest and it manifests as coughing. And if you cough hard enough or long enough, sometimes what you eat can come up. So it's like vomiting after the cough. So those are also mm. things to look at. Allergies and then maybe the child has what we call reflux. So when the child eats and um, it goes down and the child lies flat, it may a bit of it may come out. Mm. So those are the two things that come to mind. Okay, so there's another question about bedwetting, which we discussed earlier. Uh, it says, I want to know, uh, my three children are all in their teens, but they still wet their bed. I'm sure he's, he, he wants to know if there's a problem. Yes, um, teens should not wet their bed. Uh, after six to eight years, um, people should not wet their bed. So teens should not wet their bed. Now it's three teens. So... Um, I'm thinking probably there's a family history because if your parents wet the bed, maybe the mom, um, then the children also tend to wet the bed. Um, mm. um, yeah. So the same um, answer to the um, first question. So you start with modifying their behavior. Don't drink liquids close to bedtime. Use the washroom. And then they will need to be woken up. Mm. Um, they are big people. They are big um, children. So they may be able to wake up when a timer is... is um, is set for them. So maybe around when you wet, when you use the washroom before you go to bed, 
Then around midnight, the timer goes, and then you need to go and use the washroom. Mm. And maybe a bit closer to the morning, the timer goes, then you need to go and use the washroom. The same thing as if the parents or somebody else was waking them up. But because they are big, I think they could take responsibility for that one. And then ad in addition to the behavior, what you can also do, because these ones are teens, is that when they wet the bed, then they must um, clean up after themselves. So that also sends a message to the brain that it's not okay to be wetting the bed. Okay. Now... There is, um, apart from the behavioral management, there is medication. It's just that for those that are young, mostly because they may not be developmentally ready, we are not in a hurry to use medication. Mm. So this can also be um, looked at. So the child needs to go to hospital. Um, so we we'll start from the behavioral management. And then if the children are still wetting the bed, then there is medication. Of course, you have to still in exclude a lot of things. Is the infection? Are they reacting to stresses within the family? But because it's all three, I'm guessing that <coughs> they may not be, um, it's not stresses. Yes. It's right. just, yes, yeah. they are watching uh, the bed. Doc, um, the issue of children and not taking fluids um, very close to bedtime, I know of some children, toddlers, who will wake up in the middle of the night asking for water. Is that normal? Yes, that's fine. Mm. Um, we are talking about people or an age group that shouldn't be wetting their beds. All right. Sure. Yes, but as for children, they, their tummies are small. So the small children, toddlers, their tummies are small. So they can't hold a lot of things at once. Mm. So when they eat a little, they drink a little, that's fine. They go to bed, they wake up, they want, um, they want some fluid, water. You can give it to them. Okay. You don't expect, say, a three-year-old, four even, to be dry at night. Mm. So that's fine. All right, okay. So this next one, hmm, from Raymond. His son is 11 years and occasionally has blood coming from the nose. What might be the problem and the effect? And he's asking you if there's any danger? It depends on how much blood it is that is coming from the nose. There are people who have nosebleeds, tiny amounts, less than a teaspoon, occasionally, not all the time. But if this is something that is recurring very frequently and then the amount of blood is more, maybe you're talking about... Um, a tablespoon to more, then the child needs to be seen in hospital because there may be something in the nostrils that is causing the bleeding, and that one can be sorted out by the ENT. The other thing is a bleeding diathesis or um, an, a um, predisposition to bleeding. Um, so what that is is that some people are predisposed to bleeding either because the mechanism that makes um, our blood clots has a problem or the not the mechanism, but the blood itself. Um, so I don't want to scare um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Raymond by saying things that are rare but very um, dangerous and could present like this. What I want to say is that it could be just a problem in the nostrils. Mm -hmm. If the blood is small and very occasional, we don't really bother. You put pressure on it when it comes and then it goes away. It may not come in a, a year or two mm -hmm. and then a little blood comes. But if it is frequent and the amount of blood is a lot, we need to look in the nostrils. Is there something there that is causing it? And then we need to look at the blood. The blood itself, the cells, are they okay? And then its ability to clot, is it also okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so Raymond, I guess what it will be now is to just uh, go to a hospital, find a pediatrician, and try and answer all the questions that Doc has um, posed. If you are like Raymond and you have any question about your child between 0 to 17 years old, Dr. Wadu is here to answer those questions. You can send them to uh, the WhatsApp line 055-111-997-055-111-997. Or if you prefer calling, uh, just write this number down. When we open the phone lines, you can do so. 302 216 Five four one. I beg your pardon. Zero three zero two two one six five four one. That's the number to call. Good morning. Good morning to you. Nice program. In the absence of sugar, what should I put in the porridge of my seven-month-old baby? This is Maxwell from Achimtafo. In the absence of sugar, I hope that means that the parents knows that um, sugar shouldn't be part of the porridge of the seven-month-old baby. <laughs> if it's like uh, you know, the the sugar is finished. So what should I add? Um, this this question has been a huge debate on, <laughs> I think, Facebook over the weekend. So some people feel that um, sugar isn't good for the baby, say a seven-month-old, someone who is less than one year, which is true. And then they want to replace it with honey. 
And like we were saying the last time, children less than one year, one year, some people even stretch it to two years, should not take honey. So in the absence of sugar, honey is not an alternative. You can still mix the porridge of the seven-month-old baby with breast milk. Okay. Yes, you can mix it with breast milk. And, or you can mix it with formula. So after the exclusive breastfeeding, when you start um, doing complementary feeding, you can mix it with the porridge with age-appropriate formula. Or you can mix it with breast milk. You can also mix it with fruits to give it that taste that you may like. Mm. And the advantage of fruits is that um, there's a lot of fiber in it, there are vitamins, mm -hmm. there are minerals in it as well. Um, I would say same for breast milk. There's still a lot of nutrition in it, and then it helps with the taste as well. Okay. Doc, so um, if you're not supposed to give a seven-month-old baby sugar, at what time do you introduce your child to a appropriate measure of sugar? I mean, age-appropriate. From, From two? Yes, please. Wow. Okay, I'm sure a lot of us are learning something <laughs> here because uh, quite a number. It doesn't. It doesn't matter if it's brown or white sugar. It's it's just advisable to to keep them. <laughs> Actually, the difference between brown and white sugar isn't that much anyway. Brown sugar is healthier, but okay. the difference isn't that much. Okay. So if you shouldn't be eating sugar, then you shouldn't be eating brown sugar mm. either. Okay. But if you you want to eat sugar, then brown is a, a bit healthier. All then. right. Okay. So Araba from Poon sends in our next question. Good morning to you, Araba. My teen daughter has started growing gray hair around her hairline, upper arms, and a few around her eyebrows. Could it be a deficiency? She has two questions. Let's let's answer this one first. Um, it's possible that um, there's a problem. Okay. Or it's also possible that um, she comes from a family where they grow very early. Yes, so this child needs to be seen in hospital. Um, sometimes um, graying is a symptom of something else. The graying is not a problem, but it's a symptom of something else. Um, again, these are rare things, but when you go to hospital, then they ask you questions, and then they decide whether to investigate further or not. Okay. Yes, but it could be. So the second question from Araba, my second daughter is 10 and has all of a sudden become so dull and inactive. She eats in bits and spends majority of her days sleeping, sometimes waking up around 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Could she be ill? Yes, she could be ill. Um, if it were only that all of a sudden she's eating in bits, um, I, I wouldn't say anything is the problem. But because the mother is saying all of a sudden she's become dull and inactive, and then she's sleeping more in the afternoon than she used to be. Um, I'm thinking about things like um, low blood levels, because if you have low blood levels, if you're anemic, you are just generally so dull, you tend to feel sleepy, any small thing you do. I'm thinking about that. I'm also thinking about deficiencies in some um, minerals and vitamins that will um, also affect your appetite and make you not as active as you should be. But it's a 10-year-old girl. And these days, when um, any child changes behavior, you should look at certain things, including abuse. So I, I hope it's a family setting where abuse is not likely. Um, the mother can also have a conversation with the daughter um, and find out what may be the issue. Are there issues with school? Mm -hmm. um, maybe her friends, she's had a falling out with some friends. Or are there issues in the home? Any change in behavior that is sudden um, should be investigated. And for a 10-year-old girl, I would say that um, all the possibilities should be covered, including abuse. All right, uh, Araba. So uh, Doc has answered your questions, and uh, hopefully we can get some good news later uh, uh, and with regards to your 10-year-old. This one says, good morning. My three-year-old grandson started stammering about a year and a half ago. It seems to be reducing of late. Please, what can I do now? Albert from Tema. Albert, it sounds to me like um, you shouldn't worry much. Um, from two, three um, children's stammer, you can think about it like this, that they think faster than they can talk. Because at that age, they are still working on their verbal and communication skills. They are basically still learning to speak. So at that age, you could think about it like they are thinking faster than they can talk. So they mm -hmm. tend to stammer or stutter, depending on they are the same thing. So stuttering is common in the two to three year old group. And the, what comes, this kind of stuttering tends to go away on its own. But um, there are some interventions that you can do in the family to um, help the child. 
you know, it's not the fault of the child. So the first thing is not to be seen as or not to blame the child because it's just the development. She's learning or he's learning to talk and he tends to, they have so much in their minds they want to say, mm -hmm. but it's difficult because they are now learning to talk. Okay. So then they tend to stutter or to stammer. Mm. So in addition to not blaming the child, as a family, you can learn to all take your time when you are speaking mm -hmm. for the child's sake. And then sometimes when the child starts, well, you can ignore it if it's just a minor something. But then you can say something like, oh, wow, that came out a little bumpy. Mm -hmm. Could you say it again? Something like that. But be careful not to blame the child because first, it's not his fault. He really has no control over it. It's just that he's learning to speak. It tends to go away. If it happens at this age, it tends to go away. But those are some of the things. If you add on extra stresses to it, like, ah, why are you stuttering? Mm. Then they tend to do it more. Mm. Yeah. All right. There's another speech-related question. Uh, we'll take that one um, about the child. So she, he says the child is three years old, doesn't um, speak, you know, um, as children of his age group. Um, he can only say mama and daddy. And Kwame is sending us this. He's saying that he needs help. His boy is three years. Yes, I really think that Kwame, um, the help is needed. Um, a three-year-old should be saying more things than mommy and daddy. So this child should be seen in hospital. It, depending, it can just be an isolated um, speech and language problem. Or it can be um, a whole thing and then speech and language is just part of it so this child should be seen in hospital because you need a lot more things you need a history what happened during the pregnancy what happened during delivery when did the baby start attaining all the milestones before you come to saying um simple sentences about two word sentences that the child should be saying by now so yes Kwame needs help and a lot of these things when the intervention is early the outcome is very good mm -hmm. but when we delay then it becomes more difficult Right, so uh, that's uh, your answer. Uh, thank you for sending in your question, Kwame. Uh, so this one, uh, okay, no name. My son will be four years this month ending. For some time now, he cries of stomach pain as soon as he finishes eating. And after a few minutes, the pain stops. I deworm him, yet he still complains of stomach pain after eating. Please, what can be done? Hospital. Yeah, hospital Simple because <laughs> yes, because um, with this one, you know, children are very poor at localizing their pain. They are very poor at saying exactly where the pain is. Mm. So the child is complaining about stomach pain, but you need to take a lot more information, and then you also need to examine. You when you examine, you may find where exactly the pain is. Mm. It may be stomach, it may not. Yes, children are just so um, poor at saying where their pain is. I mean, it really may be stomach, but you may find something else. And then sometimes we have pain from somewhere that is referred to the stomach. It means that the problem is not in the stomach, but the mm -hmm. pain is from elsewhere. And when you get more information and you examine the child, then you know what to do. You probably also need to order some tests and then you know what to do. Okay. The next one is from Akutu. Uh, he says that his daughter is three years old and breathes heavily. The sound is quite loud, and it's very slow. Yes, so um, a three-year-old shouldn't breathe noisily. So if she's breathing noisily, then there's a problem. Um, the problem can be from the mouth, like the back of the tongue. Um, we have something there that can get enlarged, um, adenoids, so they can get big, and then it makes it... Um, when you, when you breathe, it comes out heavily. Some of them actually mouth breathe. They need to open their mouths to breathe. And then they go to bed and then they snore. So that needs to be sorted out if that is it. Because if it's not sorted out, the child's sleeping is affected, the quality of their sleep. And then they go to school and they are not able to do well because they didn't sleep well. So they are tired already even at the beginning of the day. And then ultimately, it can go beyond just the heavy breathing and the affecting of sleep to affect other things in the body. So it needs to be sorted in hospital. But it could be a few other things as well. So mm -hmm. it's, it needs to be seen in hospital so that what it is can be identified and then managed appropriately. Okay. So uh, this next question, looks like we're having a lot of questions about eating habits in children. Kwame from Tema says, my son is 11 months. He's always rejecting food. When he sees the food, he begins to cough and will not swallow it. 
he will not want to eat at all, and he wants to know if there is a problem. Again, this child is really young, 11 months old, so I would say that the parents should take it easy for the child. Now, what happens sometimes when we start to introduce complementary feeding is that we are so much in a hurry to, for the children to eat a lot. We forget that their tummies are very small. We forget that that is also learning for them, especially if you did exclusive breastfeeding or if you were even on formula, because it's just liquid. So when you now introduce the semi-solids, we forget that it's a learning process for them. And so we need to take time for them. The other thing is that when we forget about these things, and around 11 months old, at this age, the children sort of are developing a will of their own. Mm. They want to do stuff for themselves. Some of them want to feed themselves. But you know when they feed, then they get all messy, the floor is messy, and it mm. creates more work for you. <laughs> or you are going somewhere, and they will take forever mm -hmm. to do that thing that they call eating, and then you are in a hurry. So you don't want to allow them to do all these things. But that is part of learning for them as well. Because when they do that, they are practicing their hand skills. That's fine motor, which is very good. They are learning coordination. You need to take the food and take it to your mouth. But sometimes, because this is very inconvenient for us parents, and because really we are in a hurry, I am. I want to go to work, mm -hmm. so we we don't want them to do these things. And they have a will of their own. At this age, they are really prone to tantrums, so it makes it like feeding time becomes a battleground. Mm. It's such a battleground that when it goes on without any intervention, something may happen. That is called food aversion. As soon as the child sees the food, the child is in warm mood. Mm. As soon as the child sees the food, the child is in warm mood. Child sees food and then. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. so that's this story mm. could mm. also be that. Mm. But what I want to say is that as parents, when we start introducing the semi-solids to our children, it's a learning process for them. It must be fun. It must be like a game. Sometimes you actually need to line up the toys. When this toy takes one, the next one takes one, <laughs> they all take, then it's the child's turn and he takes. So we must make it as joyful as possible. And the presentation of the food, too, mm. it must be nice. The, the, um, plates, the bowls, those things also need to be nice and colorful. Let's make it play time. And let's remember that for them, they don't know that you are in a hurry. They don't know that you think that they must eat all the food. They are just taking their time. They are learning. They are playing. So let's allow them to have that. It, it helps a lot. It's a lot of learning that is going on. But when you take these things from them, as soon as they see the food, this is the time to fight. Mm. And 11, <laughs> they, are, they, they, they are really prone to tantrums. Sometimes when they say they won't do something, <laughs> it will end in tears. So <laughs> let's just take it easy yeah, for them. Yeah. But if this persists, then um, more help is needed. Because if, if this is the issue, a lot more help is needed. You need to look, okay, is it a swallowing problem? Or is it just food aversion, as I'm saying? And then... Um, the right things can be done for them. Mm. Yes, but when we start complementary feeding, let's take it easy, Clara, for them. Mm. Doc, uh, talking about aversion reminds you of uh, a, a parent I, I saw feeding her child porridge, and she literally was scooping it with her hands and held the child's nose and was forcing it down. And I, I think that that experience, and that child, I mean, she, she's, she's a teenager now, but she really, really doesn't like eating. C could, could our feeding techniques impact um, the eating habits of our children? Feeding techniques impact the feeding habits of our children. <laughs> there must be a stage where you provide the right food, even if it is small, I mean so balanced that you know that even if the child takes two scoops, the child is getting that two scoops is balanced. And then like I'm saying, to take it easy, the children must learn to associate feeding with or eating with enjoyment. But when the children learn that feeding time is battle time, then in the long run, it doesn't augur well. At this moment in time, you may be able to force the child to fill the tummy, but in the long run, it doesn't go well. And what you said, holding a child's nose and forcing food down their throats, sometimes it can be a matter of life and death. If the food goes the wrong way, <laughs> if the food goes the wrong way, because you can, you can actually kill your child by doing that. Mm. Yes, a lot of us get away with it, but you can kill your child by forcing food down your child's throat. If the food goes into the lungs, very bad pneumonia, the child will need to be in hospital on oxygen, antibiotics, you lose time away from work, you pay hospital bills, and 
not every child mm. makes it out mm. of it. Mm. Yes. So it, it's a very bad thing yeah. to do. Yeah. Thank you so much, Doc. For some of you listening to us, you may think, oh, I wouldn't do that. I'm too posh. But hey, just check it out. Maybe your nanny or your house help may be forcing food down your baby's throat when you're not there. So, I mean, this is just good education for all of us here on Home Affairs. And our aim is to make homes out of houses. Do stay with us when we come back after these short messages. Doc will be taking uh, the rest of your questions. I've seen them, a lot of them coming in. We'll try and take as many as we can right after these. Introducing the new Onga Chicken Tablet. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Ah, Ophelia, did you brush your teeth before eating? No, mommy. Anytime I use daddy's toothpaste, I get bruises in my mouth and sometimes I feel like vomiting. Mm -mm, that's not an excuse. As a child, you need to brush your teeth before you take your breakfast to avoid tartar and cavity, okay? <laughs> And you, why are you laughing at your sister? Have you brushed your teeth? Yes, ma'am. I used the Kel Kids toothpaste you brought yesterday to brush my teeth. Well done, darling. Kel Kids toothpaste is made for kids like you from two years to six years. It was so sweet like strawberry. I even wanted to eat it, mom. <laughs> no, you can't eat it. It's toothpaste, not toffee, okay? <laughs> It's always advisable to give your kids Kel Kids toothpaste to brush their teeth. Kel Kids toothpaste strengthens teeth and prevents decay and cavities. As a mother, I always make sure my kids use Kel Kids toothpaste. Kel Kids toothpaste with strawberry flavor makes brushing exciting for our kids. Kel, happy smile. This advert is FDA approved. Thank you so much for staying here on Home Affairs with me, Bernice Abubeidula. And so I'm here with Dr. Sarah Mwadwe, a pediatrician at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. And she's asking your questions um, uh, on your child's health. Um, a lot of your questions have come through. There's a question from Madeline. You say that you just had a child, but your question is not so clear. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you can look at it again and rewrite it so that we can help you uh, get some answers. Uh, but this one is from Mabel, and Mabel is listening to us from the UK. Uh, hers is actually a contribution, Doc. She says, I've realized that mixing breast milk with porridge makes the porridge watery. So uh, feeding porridge on its own then baby drinks breast milk separately. That's what she suggests. Or mixing the porridge with formula. Uh, she says that's better. So uh, Mabel, thank you for sharing your experience with us. And uh, we're, we're grateful that you're listening to us. So we'll take some of your questions. So uh, with what uh, Mabel mm. said, um, you know, the, everything has its advantages and disadvantages. So mm. for instance, if you can afford formula and you mix it appropriately, um, the the formula a manufacturer will tell you when you take one scoop is it 30 mils mm, or mm, how much mm, you mm, add to it mm. and same thing for um, breast milk you should mix it appropriately with the porridge but when, when you do that and you find that it's too watery for your child to accept then like i said it's like 
Um, what do you gain? What do you lose? If you can afford formula, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if it's breast milk that you can do, and if your child accepts it, that's fine. Okay. The only thing is to mix it appropriately. Now, when you feed porridge alone, before you are going to feed breast milk, remember that the nutritional profile of porridge alone, so for instance, are there proteins in your porridge? Are there um, vitamins and minerals in your porridge? But if the porridge is mainly carbohydrates, then that's not good for a growing child. So all these things need to be looked at. At the end of the day, what you want to do is to give a balanced meal to your child. But if you are going to... Um, give porridge and then tummy, which is small, is full of only carbohydrates, then you must make sure that over the long run in a day, you are compensating for it in other ways. Yes, so it shouldn't be that definitely by all means mix it with breast milk or mix it with formula. Mm. But by the end of the day, you should make sure that you are providing all the nutrients. Mm. And remember, the child's tummy is small. So whatever you are giving to the child, if you can make it as balanced as possible, that is good. All right. Uh, very soon, in about five minutes, I'll be opening the phone line, 030 Six five four one is the number to call. Uh, but some more questions from our WhatsApp console. My daughter is four months and gets cold easily. Uh, what causes it and what can I do to relieve it? Uh, I, I'm not sure this person was listening to us last week because we really dealt with this. But, Doc, it's okay. Uh, we have new listeners every time and we are grateful for that. So, Doc, you can answer that question about a four-month-old uh, getting cold easily. Yeah, children um, get cold easily. It's just because they are children. There are many reasons for it, but principally also because they are now encountering these gems for the first time. So they get cold easily. As you grow up, it gets better because you've, you've encountered most of these things and then your immune system is more developed. Mm. So as for cold and children, they get cold easily. It's not every cold that needs to be treated with antibiotics because mostly mostly these are viruses mm -hmm. and viruses antibiotics are against bacteria antibacteria so when you give it you're abusing the drug you're exposing the child to the side effect of medication you're wasting money because you bought it mm -hmm. so most of the time the cold and cough children get is it's part of childhood, let me say. Okay. And then you just need to watch it. There, there are some danger signs. If the child is breathing too fast, if the child's lips and tongues are looking darkish or bluish, if the child has a fever, child is vomiting, no feeding, or if you have any concerns, that child can go to hospital. But generally, cold and cough is part of childhood, okay. just because they are children. Okay. All right, great. Uh, a few more of your questions. My daughter is almost three years and is still breastfeeding. Can it affect her? Doc, let's do this one quickly and take some uh, other questions. The time when you stop breastfeeding should be a decision for the baby and the parents alone to make. So if the baby is three years old and for whatever reason is still breastfeeding, mm -hmm. there is nothing wrong with it at all. Mm -hmm. You just need to make sure that because at three months, the breast milk alone will not meet the child's nutritional needs. So you need to make sure at that... At three years? Yes, at three years, sorry. The breast milk alone will not meet the child's nutritional needs, unlike a baby from birth to six months old. Yes. Okay. So you need to make sure that um, um, the nutrition is provided by other foods. So I would say... When this child goes for the child welfare clinic or mm. weighing, mm. what do they say about the weight? You know, when you look and the weight is fine, and the baby, the child, toddler now, wants to breastfeed at three years. There's no problem with that. When okay. you stop breastfeeding, it's a decision just for you and your baby to make. Okay. All right. Uh, I have another question on feeding. At what age is it appropriate to introduce drinking water to a breastfeeding child? When you start complementary feeding then you introduce drinking water to your child. Okay. Um, but complementary feeds are semi-solid, so uh, it doesn't mean that you just you give so much water or something. When the child has finished feeding, then you um, give a little water. Or sometimes you see that they are asking for it, then you give it. From birth to six months, the child's tummy is only for um, breast milk alone, or if you are doing complementary um, replacement feeding, that's formula, which is not what we advise as our first choice. Then it's just formula alone that you give to the baby. Okay. But after six months, you introduce water. Or if the baby is less than six months, sometimes perhaps the child has a bad diarrhea or something, you go to hospital, and for whatever reason, the doctor decides that this child must take some ORS, then that is also allowed. Okay. But after six months, it's when you can introduce what to you okay okay uh just a few more of your questions but i'm ready to take the calls now zero three zero two two one six five four one uh doc this is from my namesake bernice from Oyarifa. <laughs> uh says my baby is almost two months old and can't suck breast milk properly or can't suckle the breast properly um like she used to after vaccination in the thighs but she shows signs of hunger what could be the problem um 
It will be very difficult to say because the mom's description needs to be delved into a bit. Mm -hmm. Is it that a child cannot latch onto the breast or latches onto the breast, but the motion of sucking is not coming? So it needs to be delved in mm. and into appropriately. Um, I would say that if you see a midwife or a pediatrician, then that can be um, sorted out. Okay. Um, show signs of hunger. Again, what are the signs of hunger? We need to look into that. But at the bottom of everything is, how is the child um, behaving generally? Okay. Is there a child who is sick, mm -hmm. you know, behaving sick? Mm -hmm. Because if you are not suckling properly, it could be because either you are too sick or the yeah. suckling mechanism is affected because that comes from the brain. So we need this one needs a lot Special more special attention. Um, All right, I've got my first call on the line. Hello, Josephine. Good morning. Thank you for joining the program. Let's hear you. Hi. Good morning, Araba. Good morning. I love the program and I love the discussion today. Thank you so much. Well, I, I just want to um, emphasize what Doctor mentioned earlier that um, forceful feeding should be discouraged. I had a very bad experience. I said my family experienced something bad. Okay. My sister forcefully fed my knee, and in the process she died. Oh. So please, let us discourage it. So let sorry. It. Let's make feeding fun for the children. Oh, thank you if so much, Josephine. If you don't understand anything, I really, really that. appreciate your contribution, yeah. Josephine. Yeah. And yeah, this is just a personalized example of what we were yeah, talking and about. Josephine yeah. is so strong to, to, oh. to share it on air Oof, for I've us. Got and yes, we, we don't um, seem to emphasize this enough mm. because a lot of people get away from with it. Mm. Our grandmothers, our mothers, we work, we are in a hurry. So a lot of us do this, we get away with it. But you see, you can do it just one more time and it's, it's so bad. Mm. I mean, I have handled children who died from Forceful feeding. It is not good. Mm. Even if they don't die, the stress on the family, the admission, you leave everything and you are in hospital and the child really suffers. The, it, it, it's, it's, it's bad. Mm. What, what makes it continue is that a lot of times people get away from it. But your next time could can be, be, yeah, could be tragic. It's not good. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that, Josephine. Hello, Patrick. Um, thank you for joining us. Share your thoughts with us or your question. Okay. Oh, uh, my child is three years old. Okay. And as at now, he cannot even say mama or dada. And we have been to hospital for two times. And they said there's nothing wrong with my child. Mm. We should still wait for some time, but just yes, the, the child can make some noise, which I don't understand. Okay. He cannot even form words, mm. like dada or mama or something. Mm. I don't know what is wrong with the child. Okay, so Patrick, Doc will answer help. your question. Now, Doc, really concerned parent that you can tell that this is uh, uh, must be really frustrating for, for the family. What can, what can they do? They've been to the hospital. They say there's no problem. Yes, I would be frustrated too. So I do not know... Um, what exactly went into the consultation, but I would say that there is a problem. Sometimes um, when we look and we see that it's not a global delay in development, sometimes the way we express it may come out as there isn't a problem. But a child at three should be able to speak at least two word sentences, should be able to do that. Even sometimes three word sentences should be able to do that. So if it's only speech that is the problem, um, this child's Hearing needs to be assessed. And once we determine that a child can hear, because you need to hear to learn to speak, once we determine or speak the way we do, you know, because communication, even if you are deaf, you can communicate. But what I mean is that the way we speak, you and I are speaking, you need to be able to hear to do that. So if it is determined that um, there's no other problem except the speech and hearing is fine, then the child needs speech therapy. And the earlier it is started, the better the outcome. So mm -hmm. there, definitely there's a problem here. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Patrick. Uh, let's let's see if we can get some speech therapy for your child, and uh, hopefully uh, you you can have some good news to report later. Uh, uh, I I have uh, Senna, is it Senna? Hello, Senna. Good morning. 
Good morning, please. Great to have you. Um, please, uh, I want to say um, um, I'm having a little problem with my uh, son. He's uh, 19 months now. Okay. And for eight days now, he has been passing uh, to with me because he's two. Uh, you, uh, you said for how many days? Eight days. Eight days. Yes. Nineteen months. Yes. Okay. Doc will answer your question. Okay. Thank you very much. Eight days of passing um, loose tools with mucus. Um, the child should be taken to hospital. Mm. Sometimes what we do is that when our children have diarrhea, I'm not sure what is the circumstance here, but just general for our viewers, listeners. When our children have diarrhea, we run to go and buy medication for them, especially antibiotics. And some of those antibiotics can actually worsen the diarrhea. Mm. Again, we know that at this age, the age that he described, most um, diarrhea illnesses are viruses. So the previous thing I said, antibiotics work against bacteria. Even that one, you need to carefully select because what bacteria are you killing? One antibiotic cannot kill all the bacteria. At this age, we know that the diarrhea is usually from viruses. Viruses, they go away on their own. So what has the WHO done, the Ministry of Health? Um, there have been adverts running on TV and all those things. When your child has diarrhea, what should you do? You give ORS and then you give zinc tablets. Zinc because... It shortens the duration of the diarrhea and it gives some protection against diarrhea for about the next three months. ORS because the diarrhea itself is really not a problem. What is a problem is that the water in your child's body can come very low. And because they are small and they don't eat much like the way we eat, and sometimes they are even thirsty, they can't say it, or because they, can, they, they become so weak that they cannot drink, they are at risk of getting the water in their body to become low, which is dehydration. Mm. Most of our body is water. Mm. And then once the water in the body gets low, a lot of bad things can happen okay. to the child. Mm. So diarrhea, first ORS and zinc. Mm. But he says it's been going on for eight months, um, eight for eight days. days now. It doesn't really qualify as prolonged diarrhea, but it's, mm. it's inching there. So I okay. suggest that this child is in the hospital. You take okay. a history. Sometimes you may need to take some of this to the toilet mm -hmm. and look at what it is in the mm -hmm. lab and okay. then you decide what to do all right talking about stools there's this question from celestina from asin fosu and she says her four month old baby uh, passes to which is green in color uh, she's wondering if she can know what the actual color of a uh, baby stool should be um the color of an exclusively breastfeeding baby who is say after a week is golden yellow and it has this appearance as if it is there's mashed egg in it mm. and it is watery we usually don't catch the wateriness because it's in a diaper and yeah. when you come to see the watery has uh, you know, the, yes the water has soaked but it's if you open and the baby passes this it's watery mm. it's golden yellow or brownish mm. yes and then it's, it has this mushy appearance. Now, you should expect a once-in-a-while green stool from your baby at this age. So the once-in-a-while green stool doesn't matter. It is only a problem if it is consistently. The whole day, all the stools are green. Even the next day, all the stools are green. Yes, then that baby um, has a problem and needs to be seen in hospital. Mm -hmm. But once a while, green stool, and then the next one is golden yellow, like I've described. Then you don't no need problem. to worry at all. Okay, yeah. we have John. Hello, John. Thank you for calling in. Let's hear you. Hello, John. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me, John? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, you're in home affairs. Let's hear you. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, madam. Yes, John, we can hear you. Please go ahead with your question. Yeah. The, the doctor talked about the fact that um, cold and coughs are normal in the young ones. I wanted to know the age, the age, because I have a baby who is just two weeks old. 
okay. two weeks old and she has running nose and she sometimes sneezes and coughs. Okay. All right. Doc, doc will cater for that. Doc, quickly, uh, so we can move A two-week-old with um, a running Rain nose and a cough, that I would say should be seen in hospital. It doesn't mean anything will be done because it's likely just a virus. But because the two-week-old is, is a new need, we tend to hold them a bit closer, like we are more careful with them because you need to be sure that the chest is clear and all that. If everything is fine, the child won't need medication. Mm -hmm. You just breastfeed, and then it goes away. Okay. In fact, the cure for... Um, babies who are breastfeeding, especially exclusively breastfeeding, they have a cold and cough. It's just breastfeeding. If they can feed, that's fine. So I would say because this baby is so young, is two weeks old, should be seen in hospital. Okay. Now the age, um, I only can say that it gets better as they grow because it might be a bit different if your baby is an only baby or an only child in a home. They are not, they are not um, older siblings who tend to bring viruses from school and share with this your baby. It may be different from if this baby is a, is a home where there are other siblings, other toddlers, because toddlers will bring the viruses and come and share. So it all depends on your um, exposure, what things you have been exposed to. So it might be a bit different. Mm -hmm. But let's say that by the, child, the time the child is in class one, their cold and cough should be more frequent. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, uh, thank you for calling in. Uh, Mohammed should be less frequent. Okay, <laughs> yes. should be less frequent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> Hello, Mohammed. Let's hear you. Yeah, I have a question. My question is basically that I have a son who is very years. Hello, Mohammed. We are really struggling to hear you. If your radio set is on, can you please put it off? We are getting some feedback now? as well. Yes, much better now. I said I I have a son who is uh, six to seven years now. And uh, the problem is that he likes playing. I don't know what that is normal with kids. And at, at what age would they stop uh, playing? That is the first question. The second is that I, have a, I want to find out uh, the actual month or years that is normal for children to walk. Okay. You said you your, the, your first question was that your child is between six and seven years old and likes playing. Yes. and he likes playing. He, you know, he likes playing. I don't know uh, whether... Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, all Thank right. All right. Okay, Doc. Uh, a child who likes playing too much. Hmm. <laughs> Play is the occupation of children. This was said by Maria Montessori, not me, after whom the Montessori system of school um, is named. Play is the occupation of children. It is through play that they learn. Children learn so many things from play. Mm. They learn to speak through play. They learn numerical skills. You know, if you put two pebbles, another two pebbles. They learn it through play. They learn social skills through play. Turn taking, how to interact with others, how to say sorry when you hurt someone. They learn all these things through play. I would say that now it seems we are all in a hurry to, de to deprive children of play. That is what I would say. Because... Um, now, even when children go to preschool, which is really just to make them developmentally ready to go to school, instead of playing, they are like doing, like Actual learning. learning. Yes. <laughs> so I would say that we are depriving children from playing, from being children, because that is childhood. Play is their occupation. Mm. The answer to this question is, how is this excessive play, excessive in quotes, affecting other things the child should do? For instance, at six years old, there's a particular period of time you're supposed to sit before you must feel the edge and get up by all means. Is it affecting that? Is it affecting the child's ability to, um, like when the child sits in class, is it disruptive to the whole class according to the standards that should be? So how is the play affecting the child? That is what will give us the answer to this question. Okay. If the play is such that the child even can sit down for, say, a 20-minute lesson, mm. then it's a problem. If the play is such that the child wants to play by all means, and then what is developmentally appropriate for the child to do in that setting mm. is affected, then it's a problem. But Play is the occupation of children. Mm. In fact, all our teaching of children should be done through play. It shouldn't be that you are sitting down like a university, <laughs> a university student. student. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, Richard. Hello, Richard. Do I still have Richard on the line? Yes, please. 
Hello, good morning. Let's hear you, Richard. Yeah, morning. Uh, my sister was having a uh, uh, two years student, and he started giving him water, and through that, he, he deformed. So I want to ask. Uh, why hello, Richard. I'm sorry. Um, I'm 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 struggling to hear you very well. If you could speak up a bit, so we we don't miss any part of your question. No, Richard. I'm sorry. You may have to call again. Your line appears uh, worse now. If you could call us again, I, I really would like to hear your question. Unfortunately, the line is not helping us. While we wait for another call, Doc, there's this question from our WhatsApp console. It's from Richmond uh, in Kumasi. My three-year-old daughter cannot stand, pick items, and do menial things by herself. I've been taking her uh, for physiotherapy for two years now, but I see no changes. Please, what should I do? Doc, there are similar questions um, about five-year-olds who cannot speak, or who cannot do some of these things. So if you could just address the, the issue as a whole, I'll be grateful. Okay. Um, so children develop at different rates. Um, so we have milestones that a child should attain at a particular age, but they are ranges just because children are different. Mm -hmm. um, I say so because I saw somebody whose um, child was, I think, um, well, I've forgotten that one, but there was a similar question, as you said. Mm. So children develop at different rates. Now, any child that you have um, a suspicion that is not developing the way the child should develop should go to hospital because delayed development, um, many things can cause it. So, and then many things can, so because many things can cause it, how we treat it is different. Mm. So the child should be seen in hospital, assessed, we take a history, what happened during pregnancy, what happened during delivery, what happened after delivery, all those things. And then it informs what we do. And um, the development can be all the domains are delayed, or it can be one domain. Like somebody tried to give the impression earlier that um, the child has a speech and language delay only. Uh -huh. So the intervention depends on whether it's all the domains or it's one domain. Mm -hmm. Like I said, Early intervention makes the outcome better. Mm. Now the interventions is gradual. It takes a long time. So for this um, viewer or listener who is saying that is the child is going for physiotherapy but has seen no change, I would ask, has the physiotherapist also not seen a change? Because when you are working on these things, they are slow. Mm. Maybe initially the child's head fell totally back and now the child can hold the head a bit mm. before it goes back at certain postures. Mm. And that is a change. But sometimes as parents, because we want the best for our children, we are coming from a place of love. We are in a hurry to see these changes. Mm. But these changes are gradual. Now, the management is by so many other people in addition to the doctor. So if a child has a developmental delay, you need to work on the strength of the muscles. That is physiotherapy. Mm. Now, you need to work on um the fine skills like the hand skills okay. then that is occupational therapy different from physio you need to work on speech and language so that is a speech therapist with the ent because the ent must see that the child can hear audiology must see that the child can hear ent must see that there's nothing in the ear that should be um should be solved so that the child can hear mm -hmm. nutritional because when the child is not getting the adequate nutrition mm. the brain is still developing Long after the child has been born, okay. the brain is still developing nutritional because if the child lacks critical nutrients for the brain to grow, then the development is going to be Slower. delayed. Other forms of stimulation, play therapy. So the child needs a play therapist. The whole family must be managed as a whole because in these families, there's usually a lot of anxiety because they love the child, they are so worried. So the whole family may need to see a counselor or a clinical psychologist. The whole family needs to be managed. How is the child being involved in the activities of the family? Are we isolating him? Are we embarrassed to go to church with him? You know, but all these things are experiences the child must have to help the child to catch up. Mm. All so right. all these things come in. And and so that is how you manage a developmental delay. All right, Doc. Uh, we'll take a last caller. Daniel, thank you for holding on. Let's hear you, please. 
unfortunately we lost daniel there too bad uh, we are running out of time again unfortunately uh but hope uh, for you we, for the persons uh, whose questions could not be taken individually i i want to believe that some way somehow it's been answered because we've tried to group the questions and uh, as much as possible you know, select some that will cover for all. Uh, but this one, Doc, uh, is from Naomi. She says her three-year-old has been sucking her tongue and scratching uh, near her under. I don't know if you mean her private part or under her armpit. I'm not too sure. But she's been sucking her tongue and scratching a part of her body. What should I do? Uh, uh, that's what Naomi says. She's very worried. Sucking her tongue. I'm imagining the movement. I'm actually <laughs> sucking my tongue to see what it looks like to me. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping it's not thumb sucking because that one, the answer is straightforward. But okay. sucking the tongue, um, it's an unusual movement and uh, it needs to be delved into a bit mm. because sometimes too, it can be that these children have uh, abnormal movements mm. that uh, are coming from the brain. Okay. But it is only when you take a good history and you observe the movements okay. that you can actually say what it says. It is, yeah. So it's difficult for me. Scratching her under too. Um, is the child reacting to, say, very tight panties or panties that are not cotton, they are not breathable, or has the child got uh, some yeast infection there? So that's also something to be looked at. I, I'm so sorry that this yeah, question, yeah, yeah. I'm not really no, able to. Me. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry about that, guys. Uh, but we quickly have to wrap up. But I, I want to ask you, do you know about the new delicious? Oh, yes, Ongalicious is the new delicious. Create those amazing moments with your favorite Onga seasoning. No matter your cooking experience, Onga is a delight to make great tasty meals in every home. Onga is convenient to use and bring out that great taste and aroma in your meals. Let's toast to the new Onga chicken tablet with superior taste and comfort and aroma for all your chicken meals. Mama's helping hand, Onga, proudly Ghanaian. Connect with us at Onga Ghana on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'd like to say a very big thank you to all of you who called and all of you who sent your messages. We are so grateful. Uh, that you can make time to join us. And Doc, oh, what can I say? Keeping you here for two two Saturday mornings, very early Saturday mornings. It's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Dr. Sarah Mwadui is a pediatrician at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. And if you haven't visited Baby Child and Co. yet, please do. It's uh, just Google it, Baby Child and Co. She's got wonderful videos there. I watched one recently on COVID-19 in children and uh, th that was amazing so just visit baby child and co you will see the videos you can actually join a parenting club and you see you know all your questions for those of you who, who have more questions to ask doc will be glad to help you via that website and doc if you have any contact you'd like to share apart from this um we'll be grateful to take it um so when you go to baby child and co mm. um you find a number that's um, for baby child and co you can whatsapp us okay. you can even find our email address you can send us an email and we are very responsive yeah fantastic mm -hmm. thank you so much doc and thank you all for making a uh, time to be part of this program this has been home affairs making homes out of houses and i am benis abubey dulansa i've been doing this for your regular edem night tay you'll hear from her very soon uh, <laughs> her wonderful laughter and wonderful smile we'll be back on your screens but for now it's goodbye from us enjoy the rest of, of your day uh, have fun take it easy on yourself and uh, uh, like for those of you uh, who like to, you know, make your children adults. You heard, Doc. Let them have fun. Today's a Saturday, you know. <laughs> Do something fun with your children. Let them enjoy the, the day. And uh, I'm sure that you'll see a lot of results shortly. Coming up next is the Weekend City Show here on Joy 99.7 FM. Be grateful once again. Enjoy the rest of your day.
start your day right with tasty and creamy Hollandia Evap milk, fortified with vitamin B12 and calcium in a convenient resealable pack. Hollandia Evap milk. Make